Okay, we're waiting on a couple other folks. Nope, this, this is a pure. Okay, so we got the whole group. Uh, he is, is he? Yeah. He got what do you know about that? Good for him. Balance good, yeah. Never. Yeah, you, cool. you guys ready to roll? Are we ready to? You're on. We're on. Okay. Very good. All right. Who wants to try this one? I'll try it. Yeah. Process. Um, yeah, what part of the body do you think you're on? It's scalp. Okay, good. So that's once you identify that, things get kind of more simple, don't they? Yeah. So what what do you think is the main pathologic process here? Um, I think just the way it's kind of cross-sectioned. I think we're looking at some something with the hair. Yeah, well, if it's a normal scalp, how many antigen follicles should we be looking at down here? I think, I think more than one. A lot here. more than here. Yeah, yeah, about eight or nine. A lot. We got about one. <laughs> so we know this person, if you looked at their scalp, what's it going to look like? Like my scalp. Yeah. Well, no, no, it's not going to look like this. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, like Aton's, maybe. Yeah. So they have a lot less. They're not going to have a normal number of hair follicles. Obviously, they're, they're going to have like an alopecia. So we then ask ourselves, is this inflammatory or a non-inflammatory alopecia? I think this is non-inflammatory. Yeah, there's zero it's inflammation. Going. Exactly. So yeah. it's a non-inflammatory alopecia. And then we want to ask ourselves, well, do we think it's, you know, got a scar versus non-scar? You can get like okay. scars and non inflammatory alopecia sometimes. I don't think I've seen any really any scarring. Yeah, there's really not much inflammation, no scarring. There may be a little, not really much perifollicular fibrosis of any kind here. So that looks like a non inflammatory alopecia. And you've got what looks like, if you just looked at this piece over here, and I said, is there any normal part of the body that might kind of look like this? What might you think? Um, maybe the, the face? Yeah, the face. The large sebaceous lobules, lots of follicles, but they're not rooted in the subcutaneous fat during any of them, so it kind of looks like the face. So you say, hmm, if it looks like the face but it's from the scalp, what's the most likely diagnosis? Say, androgenetic. Yeah, androgenetic alopecia. 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's pretty simple. There's one other compounding feature about this biopsy, which in this piece you really can't see it very well, but we'll look at the other piece, and we look really carefully at some of these so miniaturized follicles. This one has got a necrotic keratinocyte in it. Now what does it mean when you get necrotic keratinocytes in hair follicles? Um, what do you mean, never wrap it? Of hair yeah, it means they're dying. Exactly. If they're shifting from uh, antigen into telogen, and if you see a thick base membrane, it's catagen. The earliest sign of catagen is diffuse scattered into the neighbors of chronic keratinocytes, and later you get like the thick base membrane zone, the collapse of the follicle. So this has got androgenetic alopecia, but it's also got some background telogen effluvia. So that's kind of hard to appreciate here. The, the bulk of it is androgenetic. So if you thought it was mostly androgenetic, that's really the right answer. But it does have these miniaturized follicles in the background, and you've got one or two follicles in the cat. So that's kind of the key to diagnosing the kind of the combination of that. Some of these sort of toggle clinical photos. So that is the combination, if you will, of mostly androgenic alopecia with a little bit of background to it. So these are some clinical photos. And then um, you can basically just go to the last slide. So it kind of shows the sort of concepts of you see 
what looks like androgenetic, and then you see areas that also have more telogenase and more catagen folks, and you kind of add those two together. A little more complicated. The board would never ask you that. Uh, they're basically just kind of would expect you to recognize probably the androgenetic allocation in that one. Now, this is a classic, beautiful example of one that the board would probably will ask you about. Square punch, uh, punch biopsy looks good. Square to me. Excellent. Um, so it looks like there's um, a lot of sclerosis. Good. So what does that tell you? That the sclerosing disorder. Yeah. yeah. Good. So you put put it right in the sclerosing category right away. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really see mutation or really fibroblasts. Um, there really aren't very many fibroblasts, are there? They're kind of gone. Mm -hmm. So that's. That's really and truly a diagnosis of sclerosis when you see that, when you see like totally absent fibroblast, homogenization of the collagen bundles, thickening of the collagen bundles. That's like the three classic cardinal findings of sclerotic dermis. Mm -hmm. So the board might ask you, show you this, mm -hmm. expect you to get an answer pretty quickly. So I thought sclerodermis. Yeah. Exactly. They look exactly. You can't tell them apart. Yeah. This could be mixed connective tissue disease. It could be scleroderma. The patient might have lung disease and kidney disease and be dying. They could have one solitary plaque of morphia, for all we know. They could have Perry Romberg. They could have any of those syndromes. Um, theoretically, might have scleroderma or PCT. It could have graft versus host disease. Mm -hmm. So it's an end stage reaction that you can see in, in a lot of different things. So that's, it's really a great example of it. It's, it's really a very beautiful late stage with a great technical lab processing of it also. Everybody, everybody did well on this, including the diagnosis. Let's see the uh, clinical photo. That's a pretty bad case with an ulceration, so I just got to have that. Okay, so make sure you know everything there is to know about scleroderma because this is the kind of thing they might show you and ask you some second order questions about, not just ask you uh, what the diagnosis is. Okay. All right. Let's give this one a go. Okay, so we have a punch biopsy. And it looks like the action's primarily in the dermis. I mean, maybe the epidermis is a little bit um, atrophic in some areas, but... Yeah, which part of the dermis is involved? It looks like superficial and deep dermis. Is this abnormal up here? Well, maybe that's just... There might be some scarring and silvery last Yeah, there's right lots there. of silvery last It's not normal, but... There's not much pathology. There's something maybe abnormal about the dermis here, but this looks like where we're really mostly concerned yeah. about. And Good. you can see that there's this nodule. It's not well circumscribed, but um, with blue cells and mucin. Yeah. So do you think this was an inflammatory or a neoplastic process? Mm, probably neoplastic Good. mucin. Excellent. And... Obviously, we ask ourselves next, you know, whether we think it's benign or malignant. Just the way it's not well circumscribed and with the, I mean, it's not fitting benign patterns of what I know with mucin. Um, I'm concerned about it. Yeah, it's kind of hard to apply all the criteria because it kind of took a punch out of everything. And this is clearly a lot of the neoplasm, but if you look over here, yeah, you can see yeah, the neoplastic cells, cells over here, too. So they're all in the subcutaneous fat area here. They're between and among these collagen bundles. So you're right. It's not very well circumscribed. It's kind of pseudo little right. nodular aggregation here, but there's actually a pretty diffuse process yeah, going on here. Yeah, it's kind of going through the collagen, and you can see that the cells are pretty pleomorphic. Good. What Do you think it's epithelial or non-epithelial? Hmm. Non-epithelial. Good. So what, what, uh, why did you think it was non-epithelial? Well, the way I was thinking more like, um, like fibroblasts or myofibroblasts. Yeah, they're spindle cells, they're spindle. number one. You know, a lot of spindle-shaped cells here. Mm -hmm. So that 
generally favors non-epithelial. There are a few cases of spindle cell squamous cell and some things like that, but most of the time it's not epithelial when you see that. And also the mucin that you noted. You can't get mucin in the, in the epithelial neoplasms like basal cell and all that kind of stuff, but usually it's present within the epithelial aggregations. It's not in the stroma like this. So that kind of makes you think it might be non-epithelial also. Mm -hmm. Okay, she said fibroblast or myofibroblast. So what's the, uh, the differential diagnosis? So, so whenever I see really pleomorphic looking cells like this and um, spindle cells, I kind of think of uh, AFX. Good, excellent. Atypical fibrosanthoma, which is a fibrohistiocytic neoplasm. Now, what do you call an atypical fibrosanthoma when it's large and deep? Yeah, so we just learned that in POPAP, actually, um, theomorphic, undifferentiated sarcoma. Close. No. Um, in, in the, is it pleomorphic? Is it undifferentiated or is it dermal well, it's dermal. It's a new dermal. Um, It's a new name for it. Sorry, yeah. that's what Elston said. Yeah, now, <laughs> is that, is that a, let's, let's, okay, so we've, we've <laughs> heard the guys down tell down us that this is the new name, Dr. Fletcher. Dr. Fletcher is the world's biggest splitter. He's made a career off of taking things that were lumped together and said, we're going to divide these into new entities, so now I get five new papers after my name. And then some people just like to say, hey, good idea, I'll follow that, and, you know, we agree with it, you, you know, and whatnot. And I'm not so sure, personally. Uh, I, I, I Personally, you like the name pleomorphic dermal sarcoma. You like it. Mm, well... It's pleomorphic really it's in the dermal and it's a sarcoma. Now, is there anything else that can be pleomorphic in the dermal that's in the dermis it's a sarcoma? I mean, AFX is in the dermis, too. So. Well, what else can be in the dermis that can be pleomorphic in a sarcoma? I can think about 10 <laughs> things. Epithelioid sarcoma, angiosarcoma, yeah. <laughs> you know, fibrosarcoma, dermatofibrosarcoma tuberans. Those can all be pleomorphic. They can all be dermal, and they can be sarcoma. So it is a crappy name. And that is worldwide. Hello, everybody in the world, Dermpath Live. I don't like the name. Okay? I disagree with it. Okay? I would, I would have called it maybe pleomorphic uh, fibrohistiocytic sarcoma. Sorry, Chris. But I don't like the name because it's not specific. It's, it's always bad to go from specific to more wastebasket. It's better to go from wastebasket to more specific. And now that we have the ability to tell what these cells are, you know, why not call it pleomorphic fibrohistiocytic dermal sarcoma or something like that. It's basically, and also I didn't like when they got rid of the word malignant fibrohistiocytoma either, by the way. I, I, I thought that was a good name because it was malignant. It was fibrohistiocytic. So to me, they should go back to it. I still use it. Let's make a petition. Yeah, let's petition. Now, the one thing that is useful in this, in many ways, I don't think it's it's really almost like calling melanoma that's uh, thin a new name when it gets thick, is because this is basically the same lesion as AFX that gets deep, and the metastasize is more common. So I don't think it needs a new name. To me, it's basically is AFX, and when you get a deep AFX, it can metastasize and kill a patient. I've seen that over the years. So just because something's called AFX, you don't say, great, adios, D and C it, we'll see you later. You know, they can still have bad prognosis. So it is a malignant cancer. It's a spindle cell fibrohistiocytic malignancy with very atypical cells here. And you get cells that look that atypical, I don't care if they're here or here, they can metastasize. So this is a lesion that just kind of behaves more poorly because it's deep. But there you go. So we would have called these years ago probably just AFX. So now people decide they want to call it this name. Congratulations. So, so in our book, just so I can clarify for like our learning, because in our book it says pleomorphic undifferentiated sarcoma. And that's what I had written down for our previous lecture that that's what it stands for sub-Q. So should I just scratch out undifferentiated and put dermal, or is that a different entity than the dermal sarcoma? Does it matter? I'll let Aton answer that. Uh, this, <laughs> is is a newer name. Name. this is a newer name. Uh, pleomorphic yes. undifferentiated sarcoma is a little bit more of a waste basket, basket diagnosis where it includes more things. This is specific for... This so this goes okay. from horrible waste basket to slightly less 
horrible way to die. But basically what the, this really is, is a, it's like a superficial MFH, that we used to call it, or a deep AFX. It's the same entity. So it's not a new, it says the difference diagnosis, well, it really is the same lesion. So that's the most important thing. Okay, and I don't know that, that our boards are going to get into that. That's that's not the dermatology board. That's question. soft tissue. That's that soft option. tissue. They can they have to have something to do in the world of soft tissue. So they, they <laughs> change names and stuff like that. That's fine. We, we won't argue. Okay, who wants to give this one a go? Me. I think this one's a little less controversial. Uh, so the shape biopsy and there was a blister formation. Good. Um, the, in different parts, it almost looked like it was in on different levels. So I, in some parts, it looks almost like it's intraepidermal, and then in other parts, it's like subepidermal. But I think maybe there was just some spongiosis, spongiosis making it look like it was intraepidermal. So. Yeah, there's another reason that it might And then it's we have too. Yeah, there you go. I think that's probably the most yeah. likely reason. If you so, look over in this area, I think this is kind of a pristine set of the Okay, great. Here. Um, so now let's go back to higher power, sure. though. So let's, you're right. We've already zoomed in on the blister, which is good. Okay. Nothing wrong with that. But then let's pretend like we don't even have this part, and we're just looking at this piece. Okay. What's the pattern of the inflammation here? Um, and this is a very helpful clue for the diagnosis. Okay, it's, so it's, um, it's in the dermis. Um, it's superficial. It's not quite interface. Um, Good. So, and it doesn't look like it's perivascular from here, but maybe it is on higher power. But you're right. It's not just purely perivascular. It's involving the spaces, but the, the dermis between the blood vessels. So we have a term so like for a that. Band? Yes, band-like infiltrate. And what are these cells? Most of them are lymphocytes, but in the higher magnification, we see another cell type. Yeah, there were EOs also. Good. So that, when you see that pattern, band-like infiltrate, lymphocytes and eosinophils, especially if there's anything that's just kind of like this that's just starting, what do you think the diagnosis is? Especially when you've got this over here, we know what the diagnosis is. I went with bullet cancer. Yeah. So what did this lesion look like here? Um, that one probably wasn't a blister. I don't think. Good. This was probably not a blister here. Right. So what did this look like? Probably just red. What do we call that? Oh, sorry, like a hive or. Yeah, what do you call that though? Urticaria, it's not hive. The urticarial stage. Good, because it looks like urticaria, but it's not urticaria. That's why we call it urticariole. Mm -hmm. It means it looks like a hive, but it lasts longer, it stays there, it's got no epidermal scale. So that's why we call it urticariole. And if you get a band like infiltrate, it lymphocytes and eosinophils, it's not superficial deep wedge shape like a bite. You think of the urticarial stage of bullous pentaploid. Sometimes this is all we get. We don't get this. And we recommend the clinician, if you think this, go back and, and maybe do immuno. And sometimes it's positive. In fact, if you're going to do immuno on a patient, it's better not to biopsy this one to send it to us. Because if you get the blister itself, the immunoreactants are often degraded. So don't send this. This is good for H&E. Send this for frozen for the immuno, okay? So biopsy the urticarial stage for your direct immunofluorescence and biopsy the blister for your diagnosis. And if you're concerned about EDA versus bullous pentagoid, which is really rare, you can actually, if you have the blister, do a stain for type four collagen. Type four collagen. When type four collagen goes to the roof, it's EDA, it sticks from the base, it's bullous pentagoid. So you can do that if you really need to distinguish those two, because there is one type of EDA that looks exactly like pentagoid histologically. Is there anything else that looks exactly like pentagoid histologically? Just for the, to kind of finish the educational effort here. There's one other thing that looks exactly like bullous pentagoid histologically. Yeah. Is there a gestational... You're, you're saying pentagoid gestationis? Yeah. Yes, that's the one. Exactly. You're right. Okay, here we go. Everybody got that right? I'll show you a couple of pictures. So, see there, there's the classic urticarial lesions there with the blisters that develop on the urticarial base. Off to the right. They're off their tense blisters at first, and as time goes on and the blister fluid gets reabsorbed, they get soft and flaccid. Okay? And then you all know everything there is to know about bullous pentagoid, right? treatment. These are some of the items in the differential diagnosis. And usually for this differential, it's really not all those other things. The ones that have neutrophils usually are not. Well, you can get neutrophil rich pentagrams. It's rare. Okay. 
Another good example here. Like, each, uh, yeah, it's probably a punch. You know, they didn't do a very deep punch. It's like a little wimpy, superficial punch. You know, the punch needs to go into the fat. You should take the punch, it should go down to the white plastic part. You should never have any of the metal showing when you do a punch. If you do, you're not doing it deep enough. So just go ahead and just punch it on in there and then pull out the punch and sometimes make sure the punch specimen doesn't stay in the barrel of the punch. You'll see that sometimes too. So what's the pattern here? Inflammatory or neoplastic? Uh, inflammatory. Okay, and what's the pattern? Uh, this is like a lichenoid Yeah, it's good. You can jump straight to lichenoid. Your superficial perivascular interface lichenoid. What kind of cells are these? Dark, so yeah, so where are they? Lymph. Yeah, they're lymphocytes. And then what else do you see here that's characteristic? Um, the hypergranulosis. Yeah, hypergranulosis. Wedge shaped hypergranulosis. It looks like a little wedge there. You've got hyperkeratosis. You've got these irregular, jagged epidermal recia here. So what's the diagnosis? Um, yeah, like in Planus. It's pretty straightforward. Now, is there anything else that can do this? Lichenoid drug reaction? Yeah, lichenoid drug. Lichenoid drug can look very, very much like lichen plants. There's a couple other things, though, that you have to put in the differential. Lichenoid GDHD. Yep, that's a good one. Anybody else have any other thoughts? Benign lichenoid keratosis? Yeah, sometimes that can look almost exactly like lichen planus. Absolutely. There's a couple others. There's a nice review article this month in JAD that talks to this about lichen planus. You guys should read that. Maybe like a fungal infection? Tinning can do anything, but that's a pretty unusual one to do that. But a lichenoid photodermatitis? Look like this. Occasionally see lichenoid LE, lichenoid inflammatory infiltrating early uh, LSNA can look a lot like lichen planus, especially if it's been rubbed. Um, syphilis doesn't do anything. So this was just good old fashioned garden variety lichen planus. And there's uh, the, the article talks about all the different subtypes and they look at different kinds of therapies. It's a good article. You, should, you guys should read it. Yeah. Teach you everything you need to know about lichen planus. This is a pretty straightforward case of it. No real difficulties. Everybody got it right, I presume. It's like a guinea. Okay. Okay, let's go to the next one. All right, this is a nice example. Um, Let's say basically is a tie for that. Look to it. What kind of biopsy? Oh, looks like a shave or something. Good. Shave biopsy. Something small. Something small. It's probably like a little small papule, right? Yeah. Okay. Inflammatory or neoplastic? Neoplastic. Good. And then epithelial or non epithelial? Mm -hmm. Epithelial. Good, yeah. You've got little ducts in here. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, benign or malignant? Benign. Yeah, I like benign too. Now, the one caveat of something like this, the small biopsy thing is bigger and larger and diffuse. Just make sure it's not a sample here. So this is where you do need clinical correlation. Mm -hmm. But I favor benign too. And there's one other clue here that helps you. Whenever you see an adnexal neoplasm and there's a prominent amount of stroma, stroma is actually sort of more predominant than the epithelial component, that favors benign also. So this little pink thick hyaline stroma here in the background goes along with this lesion. So they're, they're kind of, it's, it's part and parcel to the lesion. And that's favors benign also. Okay, so we're at a higher magnification. What kind of differentiation is this now? The epithelial, what kind of epithelial? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
sweat, equine. Good, equine sweat glands. You don't see any Africa here at all. You see the little small ductal structures here with the clear staining cells and small conoidal cells that are supposed to be in there. So this is an equine glands. You say, what's the diagnosis? Yes, equine syringoma. It's a syringoma. We don't usually call it equine syringoma. And uh, what's the usual clinical scenario where we see you? Like little small skin color papules around the eye. I think the clinical picture that shows that. Yeah, that's pretty classic. But there's one other uh, situation where you can see serendomas besides the eye. This downs? Uh, it can be associated with downs. That's good. It can be. That is an association. But there's another uh, clinical presentation of serendomas other than around the eye. The downs, they still kind of usually occur on the eye. But there is another location where they can occur. And clinically, they usually get sent in as sarcoid or other diseases because clinicians don't think of it. It's usually in the genital area. Oh, okay. It's a genital, kind of eruptive syringoma that often occurs in the genitalia. I don't know how many pictures of that, but that's just another time that you can see. So you can show that slide. So that's the general multiple and type there. That's the one that we used to see. So it's pretty straightforward. Just uh, now what's in the differential just histologically that you have to worry about when you get a small shade biopsy like this? Yeah, you have to be worried about an underlying sclerosis you have to feel the neoplasm that they just didn't get a deep enough biopsy. But if it's a small little papule like that, you would never fit back. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a punch, and it's just kind of fragmented a little bit over here. But yeah, you're right. Uh, and so, kind of all the action was down in the deep dermis um, areas that you can sub about it when you see that. Um, so it's huge, like this dense kind of sheet of blue cells, um, kind of small blue cells. Yeah, so you're thinking neoplasm. Correct. And differentiation. So, epithelial or non-epithelial? Um, non-epithelial. No, no. Well, it's not typical cutaneous epithelium, is it? This doesn't look like squamous epithelium or anexal epithelium, anything like that. It might be a different kind of epithelium. Yeah, yeah, so I guess epithelial. But there is one other blue neoplastic process that can kind of look similar to this that's not epithelial at all. And that was, um, I was using, that would be like lymphoma. Yes, good, like a lymphoid lesion. Mm -hmm. So here we have, now is this a lymphoma now? Is it going to higher magnification? So look, this also looks a little different to me than a lymphoma. Um, so I was having a hard time, like, on the, uh, the, the magnification on the computer, kind of really getting a good look at the morphology of the individual cells. Um, they got a microscope right in front of you. That, that. So, <laughs> there, yeah, I see that salt container up here. Um, looks like there's almost like some nuclear molding. Some of the cells as well. Um, so there's a little bit more. Like yeah, that's a, that's a nuclear molding there, maybe, if you want to use that sort of term there. I, I guess, what's the pepper and what's the salt? I mean, I guess, is that the pepper and that's the salt? I, I've never really used that myself, but I mean, I, I guess it could be. Um, it's a lot of tons of mitotic figures. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think that if we look at my, I guess we look at those kind of things, we're probably going to stain those for something and they're probably going to be highlighted by something. What do you think those little pink dots are going to stain with? Yeah, yeah, this is going to be positive for CK and CK20 or CK20 for sure. So that's a little paranuclear dot that you can see with H and E. So you almost really don't even need the stain. You can usually confirm it with that. on the safe side given the gravity, the diagnosis. So what is the diagnosis here? It's Merkel. Or what's in the differential besides Merkel? So like Could be lymphoma, but again, when you see those little paranuclear dots like that on H and E, probably not. 
Yeah, or like another neuroendocrine. Yeah, exactly. Like one that spreads to the skin, like a metastatic small cell carcinoma. Mm -hmm. Maybe metastatic Merkel itself. Maybe the person had a Merkel somewhere else, and they yeah. it metastasized because this thing is deep. It's got some cells that are in these little cords and strands like this. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is a metastatic Merkel cell. Mm -hmm. This is necrosis on moss in the legion. Okay. So, this is Merkel cell, and we're not sure if it's a MET or if it's a primary lesion, so that's good that you're able to get that. So yeah, I'm going to stand for CK, CK20, um, possibly like one of the neuroendocrine markers, you know, some Elays, Homogranin, those kind of markers are usually going to be positive in these. So anyway, these are, are not good. Now there's one other item that's in the differential diagnosis of this, other than the two that we mentioned, lymphoma and other neuroendocrine processes that sometimes we see. You may not know the answer to that. Mm, I mean, I guess you could think of like some of the other small blue cell tumors, but I'm not... Um, yeah, those you could, like, you know, Wilms, Ewing's, that stuff, but there's one other relatively common... Like a really undifferentiated carcinoma? Yeah, well, which, which carcinoma gets kind of undifferentiated? SEC? Usually it's more basal cell. There's a variant of basal. Some people refer to it as metatypical basal, or some people use metatypical to mean that there's like sarcomatous areas mm -hmm. in the basal cell. But sometimes you can see a basal cell that looks really a lot like a Merkel cell. You stain it and it doesn't stain like a Merkel cell. So just, and then that's pretty important because you obviously don't want to call a basal cell Merkel. So, okay, very good. The next one. So we have, uh, looks like a vascular neoplasm from the deep dermis to almost subcute. Okay, good. Bluish purple cells. Benign or malignant? It looks benign. It's well circumscribed. Good. It's pretty symmetrical. Very symmetrical. I agree with you. Yeah, so you could see that already, like I said, there's already, you can see vascular spaces, and there's a lot of blue cells, and I mean, even from this power, you could see that they're pretty monomorphic. Yeah, good. So that kind of leads me into one differential, I would say, um, blue cells that are monomorphic, they kind of line up nicely around the vessels. Um, so I think we're kind of in the glomus cell differential. Okay, aspect. good. So glomus tumor. They said mm -hmm. glomus cell differential. Mm -hmm. What uh, What are the two types of glomus tumors that we see? So there's the regular glomus tumor and then there's glomangioma. Good. Which of those two do you like better here? So this one, it has the wall but for glomangioma, is it only two to three walls? This could still be glomangioma. I mean, it's usually we think of solitary glomus. We usually think of those around the digits in the finger mm. area. And this is obviously not the finger, right? This is probably the back or something right. like that. So this is more likely a glomangioma. But mm -hmm. the thicker, the more solid, the greater number of cells that we see, that tends to go along more with the solitary glomus. Time. So this one's a little bit of a hybrid lesion, so okay. you're right. So what's in the differential other than other types of glomus tumors? So other, you're looking at, look down at your board, they've got five questions. Probably other vascular tumors. Yeah, so which um, other vascular tumors might they stick on the exam to try to throw you off? I mean, it's pretty cellular, so they might... I don't know, it's pretty deep. I don't think they would put PG, but PGs can be pretty They might. Cellular. They might, yeah. This doesn't look anything um, like a PG, though, does it? Because that doesn't no, have glomus cells. It feels very cellular. I don't know if they would just throw in, like, like a, a glomus tumor that's targeted for glomus cells. Mm -hmm. or something. I mean, well, they might throw it in. There's a lot of blood like vessels dilated. Yeah. Well, what else might they throw um, in? Maybe, like, angiosarc or... Capuses, but these aren't spindles. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I wouldn't go along with I, I probably wouldn't choose those. What if they had hemangiopericytoma slash myopericytoma? 
you know, something like that. Myofibroma slash, I mean, there is some maybe myofibroma-like change there possibly, and, you know, they do get hemangiopericytoma in areas around myofibromas, so would that possibly look somewhat like this? Kind of. I, I feel like those look more like they kind of cuff around the vessels a little bit. Than these perfect kind of little more of the kind of staghorn morphology mm -hmm. to the uh, to the vascular channels, and they don't have the glomus cells on them. So that would be that wouldn't be a good choice. What if they put uh, vascular hydradenoma? <laughs> From low power, it kind of did look like a hydradenoma. <laughs> yeah, that's the one that can sometimes fool you. So you have to look carefully and say, yeah, boy, that that could be a hydradenoma component right there. If you look at that, couldn't it? I mean, that looks epithelial. Yeah, kind of that pink. Yeah, I mean, that, that could look a lot like a hip right now. But then you start looking around and you see the very classic glomus cells here that are very, very monomorphous right at the edge wall of these blood vessels, and that's helpful. So what, uh, if you wanted to do a stain on this, of course you would never do a stain yeah. on anything like this, yeah. but if you did want to stain this, what would you stain? What SMA. stain? Yes, yeah, smooth muscle actin, because these are the glomus cells. They're, Actin in their cytoplasm, they're contractile cells. Good. They might ask you which normal structure of the body do these cells normally reside in? It's in the digits. And um, what's like what's the, the name of that thing called? And I'm not a good. I don't speak French very well, but I think it's soup. Sucre Hoye canals. So, you know, not Sucwet Hoye canals. Well, that's, that's the solitary glomus. That isn't what this one would look like. But that's what those look like. So, the glomangioma, that one has like the thicker vessels, like the thicker walls of the vessels. It's got more ectatic, larger vessels and usually fewer number of glomus cells lining it. Okay. But there's some overlap. Okay. And these look very solid when you see the solid. Okay, we'll move on. Okay, so with this one, um, most of the action was in the dermis. Good. And I noted that there was an interstitial proliferation of hydro spindle cells. Okay. Um, and I thought there was some peripheral collagen trapping too. Good. Um, and then there's some overlying acanthosis and maybe induction. Um, so I thought that this, I mean, I had a little bit of differential, but I thought it looked pretty good for a uh, dermatofibroma. Okay, good. It does look a lot like a dermatofibroma. Now, that seems pretty easy, doesn't it? Yeah. Now, why would they just give us a dermatofibroma on the board exam? Hmm. Maybe I need to look a little more carefully. Okay. So I'm going to start look. looking more carefully. Okay. And... Yeah, it looks a lot like a DF right in that area, but then let's look at a couple other areas. There's some like bluish portions. Yeah, and some of the cells in the background and a little bit more kind of eosinophilic cytoplasm to them, and okay. some of them were a little bit more basophilic, and maybe they looked a little bit more kind of like maybe primitive muscle, like here, for example. Okay. See how that looks a little bit like mm -hmm. smooth muscle? Yeah. So what happens when you get a DF? Mm -hmm. And then you get areas that look kind of like, like it has muscle in it. Uh, so, a dermatomyofibroma? Yeah. It's basically a variant of a dermatofibroma that also has myofibroblastic differentiation. Again, another splitters type mm -hmm. uh, entity. Years ago, we probably would have just called these DFs and move on to the next case because they don't really matter too much okay. to the world. But it's basically a variant of a dermatofibroma okay. in which there's also myofibroblastic differentiation is the way I think about it. Not cancer, it's not leiomyosarcoma, it's not anything really to worry about. It's just an interesting sort of variant of a DF. And if you wanted to prove it, you could stain it with actin and factor 13A. Although if you stain dermatofibromas with actin, they'll be positive too sometimes. They have myofibroblastin them also. So this is kind of another one of those entities that is probably not super important. I don't know that it really has any features that look any different than a DF clinically. So uh, it's just one of these kind of interesting sort of phenomena that you should probably at least just know about. Okay. Now this one's 
another one that's fairly straightforward. So if you get something like this, the board may not want you to waste a lot of time with the diagnosis, and they may expect you then to focus on other things. So it's a punch, uh, round the scalp. Yeah, or maybe even an excision. Or yeah, because they're very, it's a pretty very big large. piece of skin here. Yeah. And something going on in the deeper dermis. Good. Very, very blue, these white cells with a lot of stuff around it. Okay. Uh, when I think blue, I think of like hair follicles. Is that all you think about? That's one thing to think about. I agree with you. Calcification. Yeah, blue, uh, yeah. There's lots of things that can be blue. So yeah, you should think about follicles. One, but you know, you can get like we saw the Merkel cell a minute ago. That's pretty bluish. We had the uh, lymphomas can be blue. There's a lot of things can be blue. So yeah, you should think about follicles. Don't just don't stop there because you may end up going down a rabbit hole. Okay, but there's other stuff here too besides that. So which part of the follicle is where blue cells like to live? Outer, root, uh, the outer uh, root. Well, that looks, you know, they can have some basophilia of some of those cells, but those often are clear because they got a lot of glycogen. But there's another part of the follicle where all the cells are blue. Okay. So there's three main parts of the follicle, right? There's the superior part, the infundibular part, then there's the isthmus, and then there's the inferior portion, which is where the hair bulb lives. And those are germinative cells. It's also blue at the stem cell area in the isthmus, but you also get it down at the papilla of the follicle. So this is recapitulating which part of the follicle? Uh, I don't I'm not sure. You know the answer to what the entity is, don't you? What's the, what's the diagnosis? Pilomatricoma. Okay, why do we call it pilomatricoma? Pilo is hair. Right. Matrix means what? It's the matrix. The matrical epithelium. <laughs> <laughs> so this is recapitulating the matrical epithelium. And why are all these mitotic figures here? Is this thing malignant? No. No. It's because it's very rapidly producing... Reper, you know, rapidly turning over epithelium. So when you know you give our patients chemotherapy for cancer and stuff like that, their hair falls out. Well, that's because their hair is these follicular matrical cells are rapidly proliferating like this, and we turn them off. Hair falls out. So this is basically recapitulating matrical epithelium. And what's this recapitulating over here? What are these cells? Shadow cells. Shadow cells. What's that? What's, what's happening here in, in, in vivo? What's that, going on here? Uh, yeah, necrosis. Well, yeah, it is a type of necrosis, but what's, what's it doing? You know, your hair shafts are basically no longer alive. They were once living cells. And so what's happening here? The keratin. It's trying to make a hair shaft. So this is an, a, a neoplasm. It's, you know, or some people refer to it as cyst in a way, benign but it's trying to make hair shafts and it ain't cutting it. It's producing these shadow cells that are abortive hair shafts and turn into a cyst. So this is pilometricoma. So they probably expected to get the answer pretty fast and they might say, is there, are there any diseases associated with pilometricoma? Cowden's can. There's about four or five. There's the old classic myotonic dystrophy, or Friedrich's ataxia, that can be associated with it. Then there's a glioblastoma, gliomatosis, and multiple, glio, and multiple be associated with glioblastoma multiple forming has been reported in the literature. So there's a few things that are associated with this that you need to know about. So just make sure that you know that, because that's something the board would very well like to ask. So there's a clinical... These also are known as calcifying epithelium of malheur. This would be the calcium that will often calcify, they can even ossify. So there's a clinical of it. They often look bluish. It's sent into this as real out basal cell. Okay. Fantastic, beautiful biopsy. Just doesn't get any better than this. Gorgeous.
Um, so it looks like a big old. Yeah, this is an excisional biopsy, right? The excision is probably therapeutic excision, so they already had the diagnosis. It's good that you got this because this is now contrasting with your other case. <laughs> so what's going on here? Um, that, it looks like a lot of uh, glandular. Okay, so it's, like it's, it's neoplasm stuff. Yeah, and it's it's epithelial because it's glandular like, right? Mm -hmm. Benign or malignant? I would say malignant. Yeah, look how big this is. This oh, is about okay. a centimeter across here. And these cells are present diffusely between and on collagen bundles. Goes from this area all the way down to this area. So they just barely got this out. They might have even had a positive margin here for this. May have been a Mose or something, but they, they came pretty doggone close to this thing. And that's fairly common. So a, you think it's primary or metastatic? Well, I was thinking this could be metastatic. It's possible, but usually when it's this large and this broad and this diffused and goes all the way to the fat like this, that favors primary. Okay. Okay. And you can see there is some area that kind of looks like glandular or maybe primitive follicular differentiation here. So what's the diagnosis? Um, I was thinking... I guess, oh, contrasting with earlier, like a MAC. Yeah, this is microcystic adnexal carcinoma. Okay, and I like that term. Now, microcystic, well, everything in the microscope is mi micro, but still, these are small, little cystic, right, maybe real ducts structures. So if you want to microcyst, that's fine. It's adnexal because it's probably both follicular and maybe eccrine slash apocrine, and it's carcinoma. So this, if you just had a superficial shave biopsy of something like that, you're not going to get a diagnosis of that. This diagnosis is based on the density and the diffusiveness of the process. If you look at the individual cells, this one's got a mitotic figure, but they don't have to. They can make it look pretty bland and benign. These don't look too terribly atypical, these little aggregations. So you really need architecture for this lesion. You need to see how deep it goes. And one other thing that's commonly seen here is what? These are usually involved. Okay. Nerves. I'll well, see this one's not involved here. Maybe, possibly, that might be some involvement there. But these commonly involve nerve. So this is microcystic and nexal carcinoma. And in order to make that diagnosis, you really have to get a deep biopsy. These clinically don't look too bad either. They often look like this. They look like skin-colored plaques that may be indurated. So very nice example of that. Okay. Who wants to give this one a go? Quick shave biopsy here. So you see kind of this like down in the, the there's like an epidermal proliferation that's coming off the epidermis going into the dermis looks like yeah especially over in this piece and this piece over here here there's not much epidermal continuity maybe there but and so it's epithelial mm -hmm. <clears throat> what kind of epithelial mm -hmm. like It's a little like the last one, sort of, doesn't oh, it? Yeah. It's like a little small ductal yeah. differentiation. It's got these little corals of epithelial cells that are both dark and pale. Mm -hmm. So it's, again, kind of an adnexal. Yeah. Ecrine slash apocrine. We don't have any good apocrine differentiation, so probably ecrine. Ecrine neoplasm differential. Yeah. yeah, so what? any ideas of what this is? Um, this is an unusual variant of it. As that we're looking at here, because usually this gives you more of kind of an interlacing reticulated appearance of this mm -hmm. specific strands, lesion. Usually more, like usually would see more strands of this. So what do you think it is? Syringofibroadenoma. Yeah, this is an ecrine syringofibroadenoma. So it's got the syringo component up here. This is the fibro component mm -hmm. here. Yeah, that fibrostoma. So fibro yeah, this this is an ecrine syringofibroadenoma. Now this can occur as a reaction pattern also. Some entities. 
like in people that have bad stasis dermatitis, you'll sometimes see ecbine serino fibroadenomatous change. In some patients that had uh, Schultz Passage, <laughs> they get it there too. And that can look like an erythroderma. This is an example of one. Probably this is the reactive, the stasis change, and the guy's lips all swollen and everything. So this is probably a reactive process here. Anyway, it can be seen in, uh, in the next slide. A number of different settings. It's benign. It doesn't really need any treatment. But you know, sometimes these things are kind of there's mass effects. Got hanging your shoe on probably or something like that size here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just remember, it can be associated with other settings too. So getting kind of a morning of adnexal neoplasms yeah, here. Yes. Mm -hmm. This one was on the differential from mine last two. Yeah. Um, same thing, like it's more purple than blue, I would say, like more than deep blue. Yeah, so it's kind of a little paler, isn't it's it? It's more pale, and Good. so I could tell that's how I kind of differentiate these tumors. Um, so it's a neoplasm, it's benign because it's well circumscribed. Yeah. Um, and epithelial? See, it's epithelial. Good. Um, and then it's purple, and then it has pink within it. So, and pink looks like more like probably like secretion, like sweat. Good. This is secretion over here. Mm -hmm. What's this pink over here? I think that's just part of the. It's probably some basal membrane zone material, or maybe some collagen in there. So, <clears throat> like type four collagen, if you stain it, would be positive for PAS. And then the cells, as you noted, there's some clear staining cells and then some little more dark cuboidal cells over here. Mm -hmm. So what's the diagnosis? Hydradenoma. Yeah, this is a hydradenoma. It's got a solid area over here. And then it's also got a little cystic area. So we might call this a solid cystic hydradenoma, but it's definitely a hydradenoma. Yeah, and it is in the differential diagnosis of glomus. So that's good. But it's you can tell the difference. If you look at them side by side, it's nice. You can see the two. Heart. So these just look like dermal nodules, usually on the head and neck area. This one's seen on the trunk and extremity, and they, they don't have a lot of characteristic features. So pretty straightforward. There's a lot of different subtypes of hydradenomas. There's, there's the poroid hydradenoma. There's just a nodular type. So this, this is this more of a solid and cystic type. Okay, so for this one, um, I felt most of the change again was in the dermis. Um, what part of the body are we on here? You know, I didn't make a note of that, but it looks like the stratum corneum is pretty thin. Um, there might be some overlying acanthosis. Um, there's, I don't see, do I see hairs? Is the face just gone? Good. I mean, I guess the skin, I mean the face, I, I don't see any. Yeah, there's really no cornified layer, is there? There's like, oh, so maybe the lip are yeah, this is mucosal, mucosal surface. Good. So was this an inflammatory or a neoplastic process? Inflammatory. And then what's the pattern? Um, it's pretty diffuse. I think. Yeah, I would agree. Very diffuse here. And what kind of cells are in the infiltrate? Um, there was some uh, lymphocytes. Um, I thought there maybe was a little bit of granuloma formation. Yeah, quite a bit of granuloma formation. And then what's going on over here? Yeah, so that's what struck me first. So I thought about maybe depositional things or um, foreign body. Um, yeah. And then on higher powers, pretty amorphous blue material, non-cellular. So I thought about um, the fillers or foreign body things. Good. Um, so we're looking down at the multiple choice questions yes. now. And they have uh, gout as a choice. That should be more cleft. Yeah, good. You see little feathery kind of cleft-like structures. Good. So you throw that out. They put uh, calcium hydroxyl apatite filler. That one is more red, I think. It's that sculpture. They look kind of like BBs, kind of BBs, gray okay. BBs. And I think the other one is the um, acrylic, acrylate, methyl methacrylate. Oh, yeah. BBs. Yeah, okay. Those look like kind of um, clear BBs. So you get, you get different colored, they're little you know, round structures in the skin. And so you throw that out. So which one is, are you looking for? Uh, hyaluronic acid. Yeah, hyaluronic acid. It looks like bluish gray jello that fractures in the skin. So that's 
what this is. The other one is Juvederm, you know, that's, so any high, the, the hyaluronic acids, they all kind of look similar. So good, so this is a filler reaction. Will we have to know the, uh, be able to tell the difference between PLLA and the PMMA on the board? Probably not. That's a little sophisticated. I think as long as you have the right category, you think you're probably good on that. But this is the actual person where the biopsy came from. She actually was taken from pretty close to her lip there. And she did have hyaluronic acid in her face. Oh, yeah, the last one. It's a cute, fun one to do. Shave. The epidermis looks a bit acanthotic. Yeah, it's a little bit acanthotic. It's kind of thrown into this little, it's almost kind of warning, doesn't it? Large white spaces. Yeah, it looks all, all these white spaces. Good, excellent. White, clear spaces. Now, that's abnormal. So we're going to higher magnification. What do you think was causing those white spaces? Air or something um, else? There seems to be some material in the white spaces, a clear material. Yeah. Um, hypocellular or very minimal infiltrate. Um, I don't feel like it's no red blood cells in it. Yeah, no red like blood cells in it. I agree. Or none. But what's this stuff? You think that's just artifact? Yes, it's lymph. And what's this little thing right here? This is beautiful. That's, you just don't see that cut that well like that. That's like a fugu chef. It cut perfectly right into that little structure. There. It's fantastic. What is that that I'm pointing out there? Oh, uh, I don't know. It looks like a valve. It is a valve. It's perfect. It's a perfect transection of a valve. You just don't ever see it quite that beautiful line. That's gorgeous. So what's the diagnosis? Lymph. Yeah, lymphangioma. Lymphangioma. What, what's the clinical? There are two clinical scenarios where we see in dermatology where we see lymphangiomas. What's the most common that we see that gets submitted as rule out bullous pentagoid? Anybody know? No, no, that's not really a true lymphangioma. That's just lymphic atasia. That's true. But we're talking about lymphangiomas. Okay. There are two clinical settings where we see lymphangiomas, the real thing, not just lymphic lymphatic, uh, dilatation. It's like a lymphangioma circumscriptum. Yeah, lymphangioma circumscriptum. What does that look like clinically? Yeah, frog spawn. Good. And what's the other one? Like in kids, swollen neck, and the cry gets bigger. What do you call that? Oh, like a uh, like cystic hygroma. Yeah. It's a deep lymphangioma. So this would be, given that verrucous feature like this, look like a little frog spawn. They're going to like turn into tadpoles. <laughs> so those, that's lymphangioma circumscription. And people often think that's a blistering disease. Yeah. Wrongly. But they biopsy and they send in this rule out of blister. So... Beautiful. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.